Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 176, Photinus of Sirmium. Photinus was a popular bishop at Sirmium, which we heard about back in episode 174, and he's known to have been a good speaker and an effective preacher, and apparently he had the support of his parishioners. He was originally from Ancyra and was known to be a student of Marcellus, who we discussed in the last episode of the Trinity's podcast. But Photinus's views are different than Marcellus's, although related, and Photinus's views became more notorious. The ancient writer Vincent of Laren, writing a couple of generations later, summarizes Photinus's views well enough. Photinus holds the unity of God after the Jewish manner. He allows not any trinity of persons. He says that Christ was a man born of Mary. He denies the personality of the Word and the Spirit. There was only one God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom we ought to serve. The first thing I'll say about Photinus is that it's hard to get good information about him. Most specialists in the history of Christian theology neglect Photinus because they're completely unsympathetic to his views. Some may imagine that he must have been some sort of rationalist or deist. I mean, how do you get a mere man Christology out of the Bible? Well, we'll get to that later. It's not as hard as some people think. Fortunately, one of the all-time greats of apologetics and patristic history, Nathaniel Lardner, who died in 1768, does pay full attention to Photinus's life, legacy, and to his theological stance. And I've also found a handful of good articles about Photinus. One's by Lydia Agnew Speller from 1983. And an even better one is by D.H. Williams of Baylor University, published in 2006. And I'll have the full references for you and links to these articles on the blog post for this episode. Were Photinus's views radical? Yes, in a sense, but not radical in the sense of being a Gnostic or even someone really strongly branching off of the tradition, like Marcion. As Lardner observes, Photinus must have accepted the same scriptures as others because there are no complaints in his lifetime about him differing on that score. He also seems to have accepted the miraculous conception of Jesus, although some ancient reports are confused about this. As far as I can tell, he bears little resemblance to an 18th or 19th century rationalist or deist. So how do you arrive at such radical views? I think a key to it is remembering that his teacher, or at least one of his teachers, is Marcellus. He doesn't have a lot of respect for Origen or for the whole Originist tradition. He thinks it's over-Hellenized. He thinks it's speculative, which it was, and he doesn't think there needs to be an intermediary between God and creation. And he's hostile to the suggestion that there is a lesser God who's actually the direct creator. In short, he just never bought into Logos theory. If you don't buy into Logos theory and you don't read the New Testament in the way that Logos theory demands, you can easily come to these sorts of views. I can tell you that firsthand. Lardner was another. There's been a drumbeat of people through the history of the Christian church who have come to similar conclusions, more or less independently of one another. Photinus is what we nowadays call a biblical Unitarian. In 4th century Catholic Christianity, this was not a tolerated view. The way things have developed, bishops have taken away from scholars the power of arguing freely about these things. It's the bishops who decide. They're kind of a ruling class. And they were instinctively conservative and tended to be very deferential to preceding tradition. They were also strongly given towards taking intellectual shortcuts, just slapping a heresy label on a position and then dismissing it. They were not really inclined to rethink any of these issues. More or less, once something gets a heresy label, it's damned. There's no chance for it to be argued successfully in this crowd. At the time, then, the two big parties were the Easterners, who were subordinationists, and then the pro-Nicene side, who were more Western and leaned in the direction of monarchian theologies. But one thing they could both agree on is that it's just crazy to think that Christ was a mere man. 
and he doesn't have a divine nature in addition to a human nature. We don't know really when Photinus became a bishop. Some think he might have been appointed at Certica in 343. You might think then that he had signed on to the Creed of Nicaea and to the Western Statement from Certica. I'm not sure if that's right. Some say that he was censured at Antioch in 344. But we do know this. He was officially condemned for the first time in the year 344 or 345 in what's called the macro stitch or the Creed of the Long Lines. We heard about this back in podcast 172, but when I played it for you then, I admitted the parts that are specifically about him. Here are some of the shots that, that council fired in his direction. The disciples of Paul of Samosata say that after the Incarnation, he was by advance made God, though by nature a mere man. But we acknowledge that, though he be subordinate to his Father and God, yet being before the ages begotten from God, he is God perfect according to nature, and true God, and not first man, and then God, but first God, and then becoming man for us, and never having been deprived of being. We abhor, besides, and anathematize those who say falsely that he is but the mere word of God, and non-existent, having his being in another, at one time the expressed word, as some say, at another the imminent word, holding that he was not Christ, or Son of God, or Mediator, or Image of God before ages, but that he first became Christ and Son of God when he took our flesh from the Virgin, not quite four hundred years ago. For they will have it that then Christ began his kingdom, and that it will have an end after the consummation of all, and the judgment. Such are the disciples of Marcellus and Scotinus of Galatian and Chira, who, like Jews, deny Christ's existence before ages, and his Godhead and unending kingdom, upon pretense of supporting the divine monarchy. We, on the contrary, regard him not as simply God's expressed or imminent word, but as living God and word, existing by himself, and Son of God and Christ, being and abiding with his Father before all ages, and that not in foreknowledge only, and ministering to him for the whole creation, whether of things visible or invisible. For it was to the Son that the Father said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And it was him who was seen by the patriarchs, who gave the law, spoke by the prophets, and at last became man, and manifested his own Father to all men, and who reigns to never-ending ages. For Christ has taken no recent dignity, but we have believed him to be perfect from the first, and like in all things to the Father. The first thing to notice about this is there's some really aggressive rhetoric in it. For one thing, they're lumping together Marcellus and Photinus, even though their views are quite different. For another, they're labeling them disciples of Paul of Samosata, a bishop who had been condemned by a synod back in the 3rd century. Again, they mention Marcellus's notorious claim that Christ's kingdom will come to an end. That doesn't seem to apply to Photinus. And when they anathematize those who falsely say that he is but the mere word of God and non-existence, as if Jesus is something just spoken and not a being in his own right. As we'll see, that's not Photinus's view. It's not clear whether or not that's fair to Marcellus. Again, they're both said to be like Jews who are denying what's obvious, namely Christ's existence before the ages, as well as his divine nature. So they're being rough. They're lumping too many different things together. Also, I don't know if you caught it, but they changed his name in order to mock him. Instead of Photinus, which means light, they changed it to Scotinus, which means darkness. But they do have an idea what they're condemning. It must have been Photinus's view that Christ eternally existed in foreknowledge only. We'll talk about why later. And it's definitely his view that the one God alone created, and he didn't have to have any help from a second God. It's a little distressing that these bishops require the interpretation that the father was talking to the son as in an interpersonal conversation in Genesis 1 with let us make man in our image. And also, how can they demand the interpretation that it was really the son that was seen all those times? That's not an explicit New Testament teaching, and it can definitely be argued. But the condemnations kept coming. 
Photinus was condemned at Milan in 345 and 347, and at Sirmium in 348. But despite all of these anathemas, he was still serving as bishop in Sirmium. Evidently, the home crowd loved him, and it must have been that many of them were convinced by his arguments. But three years later, they finally managed to get to him. The emperor Constantius II called for a council in his hometown of Sirmium in 351. This resulted in the creed we talked about two episodes ago. And he requested to be able to debate for his views. So he engaged in a long knockdown debate in front of everyone and was judged to be the loser. He was finally then deposed. He lost his position as bishop. Ancient historians say that they offered to restore him to his position as bishop if he would just recant, but he refused. Historian R.P.C. Hansen says that Photinus probably returned to Sirmium when Constantius II died in 361, but he was exiled again by Emperor Valentinian I in 364. He seems to have written the emperor a public letter at this time, but like all of his works, it's been lost to the ravages of time. Some have speculated that maybe Photinus was restored again to his position as bishop by the emperor Julian, but we have no specific report about this. This pagan emperor, often called Julian the Apostate because he'd probably been baptized as a Christian, did write to Photinus in the year 362, and a portion of that letter has been preserved. The emperor says, O Photinus, you at any rate seem to maintain what is probably true and come nearest to being saved, and do well to believe that he whom one holds to be a god can by no means be brought into the womb. And then he contrasts Photinus's views with uh, another person. Basically, the emperor's trolling. He hates Christianity. He thinks it's stupid. He mocks their newfangled Galilean god. He's congratulating Photinus just to antagonize the majority. Multiple sources say that Photinus wrote many books after being deposed and exiled, and that he wrote in both Greek and Latin. It's a real shame that we've lost these sources. And it's especially a shame that we lost the records that were taken of this debate that he had at the council. About that debate transcript, Nathaniel Lardner says dryly, If it had been still extant, in all probability it would have appeared curious to some in our times. Well, sure, because in the 18th century there were getting to be more and more what we now call biblical Unitarians. People who believe in miracles, people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, people who accept all of the explicit teaching of the New Testament, but they read the New Testament as not teaching that Christ has a divine nature, or that he created the world, or that he has always existed. On the other hand, they insist that it does teach that he's a real man. Photinus wasn't the first to hold these kind of views, nor was he the last. R.P.C. Hansen says, his doctrine left little impression in the Eastern Church, but had quite a long history of perpetuation into the 5th century in the Western Church, perhaps because traditional Western theology was more congenial to it. A term that gets put onto this sort of theology over and over is adoptionism. That label is sometimes put on Photinus, and it's put on a number of later people. This is the view, basically, that the man Jesus, because of his good behavior, was promoted to being the Christ, or maybe also promoted to some sort of divinity as well. I don't know about others, but I don't see any reason to think that Photinus would have thought that. It seems to me that New Testament writers are not concerned to date when exactly Jesus became the Christ. Peter famously says that God has made him both Lord and Christ. It sounds like he's fully into his calling, fully serving his office after his exaltation but yet Peter confesses him to be the Christ when he's in the middle of his earthly ministry. I think the New Testament perspective is that Jesus was predestined to be the Christ, and so there are different sort of stages in his career. You could say he was always the Christ. You could say he really starts the ministry when he's baptized by John and the power comes down on him. Or you could say he's fully the Christ after his exaltation. On the other hand, you might think he's only really fully Christ when he's on David's throne after his return. But they don't withhold the title of Christ from him until then. In fact, in one famous passage, which we'll hear later, Luke chapter 1, he's called the Son of God, which is a messianic title, seemingly from the time of his conception. 
He's called that just because of the way in which he was conceived. But it's never hinted that Jesus could have just said no and walked away and God would have gone and found himself another Christ. In any case, I don't see why Photonus would be committed to anything like that. About the continuing influence of this type of understanding of Christ, there's the interesting example of the famous Augustine. In his Confessions, Book 7, Chapter 19, he tells us that at one point he accepted this type of view of Christ. Augustine writes, I thought of Christ my Lord as of a man of marvelous wisdom, whom no other could possibly equal. And I saw his miraculous birth from a virgin as a mark of divine care for us, which surely merited for him complete authority as our master. But the mystery contained in the truth that the word was made flesh, I could not even faintly glimpse. Notice what he doesn't say here. He doesn't say that he was blown away by the importance of the man Jesus being God's unique Messiah. He later mentions Photinus by name. He doesn't say really in detail how he was persuaded that this view was mistaken. He just thinks that he's more enlightened now. Like Origen, he thinks that to perceive the man Jesus is only the first step. You have to then move on to perceive the divine word which is hidden within him. And that's the real deeper spiritual gospel, Origen says. Augustine, I think, agrees. When the Trinity's podcast returns, we zoom in further on Photonus's Christology. Unlike his teacher Marcellus, Photonus clearly affirms that Christ had a human soul. The dualist view of a human being is that a living human consists of body and soul, with only the soul being essential. That is, one can exist without a body, but one can't exist without a soul. So for Photonus, Jesus was and is a real man, a human person. This is in contrast to what became the mainstream view later on. As I understand it, the fully developed Catholic view is that Christ, the incarnate word, is, quote, man, but not a man. In other words, the predicate, the term, man, applies to him because the word has entered into a mysterious union with a complete human nature. So they say that the word becomes human, and that you can say human about the word, or man about the word, but they deny that it's a man. Photonus would say that this is a mistake. Why? Because in his view, the Bible straightforwardly and explicitly teaches that Jesus is a man, a human being. Another thing that he must have gotten from his teacher Marcellus is that it's important to have a clear and self-consistent monotheism. And they would have agreed, even with the Eusebians, that the one unique God is none other than the Father. What about the Logos of John 1, then? That is, the Word in this famous passage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. RPC Hansen says, The Logos for him was simply a mode of manifestation of the Father, a power or aspect of him, not in any serious sense distinct from him. He apparently coined the word word father, in Greek, logopator, and regarded logos as wholly interchangeable with God. Like Marcellus, he favored the analogy of a man and his thought for the relation of the father to the son. Let me stop there. I think that's a mistake by Hansen. As I understand him, Photonus distinguishes the man Jesus from God's eternal word or logos. The thinker and thought analogy only makes sense for the relation between God and God's word. It doesn't make sense for the relation between God and his son, that is, the man Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. 
The word or logos for photonus is something like a power or action of God, which is active in the man Jesus. That's what he understands by verse 14. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. This doesn't describe a God becoming human in his view. What it describes is the one God acting, working, revealing through this unique man. He may then have talked about the word father, but he could not, as was alleged about some early monarchians, have talked about a son father. There is no son father. That's not a thing. Word father, if he used that term, was designed to show that there aren't two things there, but only a being and his action. Why would it matter that Jesus is a man? Why would it be important to insist that Jesus is a self distinct from God? Well, they are depicted as having an interpersonal relationship in the New Testament. They talk to one another. They cooperate together. One sends the other who obeys him. That requires them to be two, two selves. And a self is a personal being. And again, if Christ is to be the mediator between God and man... That requires that he's someone other than God. He has to be a third party to mediate, whatever that mediation consists of. What else does Photonus teach about Jesus? We already heard that he denies that Jesus eternally existed or existed before the world was made. Rather, Jesus came to exist at the time of his miraculous conception in Mary. Well, that's what you would think when you read the two genealogies that are given for Jesus. He's coming along in this long line of people, and he doesn't come before all of them. He comes at the end of the lineage. That's just the assumption that lies behind giving that type of genealogy. Who was it that was seen in various places in the Old Testament? In Photonus' view, that was God, just like it says. It wasn't the pre-human Jesus. And when the person of Jesus does make an appearance... In the book of Daniel, a one like a son of a man, this is by way of prophetic prediction. It's not because Jesus existed then and was doing things back then. He holds that Adam existed before Christ, not the other way around. And he may have said that the Holy Spirit is the same thing as the Logos. One source charges Photinus or the Photinians with identifying, that is, collapsing together the Son and the Spirit. But this, on Photonus's views, could only be the Logos, not the man Jesus. Like Marcellus, he thought that the Logos and the Spirit were God's actions, so he may have said they're the same thing, or maybe he just said that it's the same God who's performing both. So in the working of the Holy Spirit, that's just God working, and in the workings of the Logos, that's God working also. To say that God creates the world by his word is just to say that God creates the world. Another interesting ancient accusation against Photonus is that he makes the Holy Spirit, quote, greater than Christ. This is thought to be just obviously stupid because Christ must be equally great with the Holy Spirit. Well, there have been plenty of Christians who have denied that Christ is equally great with the Holy Spirit. A lot of the subordinationists thought the Holy Spirit was the third greatest being. But leaving that aside, could Photonus have said this? Sure, he could have. If he thinks the Holy Spirit is just God, or a mode of God, or an action of God, then God is going to be greater than Christ. Christ, again, doesn't mean the Word. It doesn't mean the Logos. Christ means the man Jesus. So, of course, God is greater than the man Jesus. The Holy Spirit's a roundabout way of referring to God, and you could say the Spirit's greater than Jesus. Some also charge that Photonus' views imply that there are two sons. But that's a mistake. He doesn't have two sons of God. He has one son of God. He doesn't think the Logos counts as a son of God. Another allegation that you find in some ancient sources is that Photonus taught that Jesus is only a son of God in the sense that any Christian is a son of God. This, I think, is most unlikely. As I'll explain, Jesus on this type of Christology is not just another child of God in the sense that any believer is. You might well ask, what are the differences then, since you're saying that there's no divine nature in Jesus? 
why isn't it enough to point out the explicit teachings of the New Testament about Jesus, namely that Jesus is God's unique Messiah? He's uniquely empowered by God with a unique degree of divine revelation and is also given a unique authority. As a reward for his extreme obedience, he's now been uniquely raised and exalted by God to God's right hand so that all people must worship him, as Paul says in Philippians 2, to the glory of God. To call all that a mere man seems kind of silly. It's just to insist that his metaphysical composition is the thing that matters. Either you've got a divine nature there, or you're just dealing with a dude. There's probably an echo of how Photinians would defend the uniqueness of Christ right in the report of Augustine, part of which I read before. Augustine goes on to say, I thought he was to be preferred to all others because of the great excellence of his human nature and his more perfect participation in wisdom. He's saying that he thought that Jesus was uniquely wise, and he mentioned the virgin birth before. Of course, being Messiah goes far beyond those two things. There's also his work as relates to atonement. When the Trinity's podcast returns, some of Photinus's favorite texts in the Bible and his understanding of them. heresy hunter Epiphanius says that at his famous debate, Photinus boasted that he was prepared to offer a hundred proof texts for his proposition. I wonder what that proposition was. Could it just have been that the Father is the one true God? You might be able to find a hundred texts where terms like the Father and God are used interchangeably. We're told that another of Photinus' favorite passages was Isaiah chapter 44. I am the first and the last. There is no other God. Who is like me? Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times, when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble. Do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock. Not one. Who's talking here? The New Testament view is that the God of the Jews is the Father. So this would be the Father. Yahweh is the one who's called Father in the New Testament. Well, then no one else is God. At least no one else can be called God in the same sense that the Father can be called God. Interestingly, this obvious reading was damned at the First Council of Sirmium. They said, If anyone interprets the text, I am God the first, and I am after those things, and apart from me there is no God, which applies to the destruction of idols and things which are not gods, as implying the destruction of the only begotten, who is God before the ages, in the Jewish tradition. Now, they have a point here. Terms like all or none are relative to an assumed domain. They're relative to an assumed context. And it was part of the context that there were a lot of pagan deities competing for the Israelites' attention. And so this prophet is saying to them in the voice of God, no, I'm the only God. The council is demanding that the meaning of that is that I'm the only God out of the collection of me and all these idols. Well, but he says he's the first God who ever was and the last one that will ever be. So it's hard to see why it should be just tied down to that one context. The Eusebians wanted to say that, hey, there is another God. It's the word. Subordinate, yes, but still a God. And this shouldn't rule that out. 
Well, as you see in the New Testament, still you can call beings other than God, God, despite this. This isn't making the assertion that only one being can be called God. It's making the assertion that Yahweh is the only one who is God. This status of being God is only had by one. It's had by him. If there's some lesser status in virtue of which you can refer to other beings as gods, well, fine. This is consistent with that. I don't think it is saying that Yahweh is the only God out of the collection of only him and the idols. I think he's saying that in all times and places, he's the one God. Again, it's distressing how a contentious and stretched interpretation can be mandated by these bishops. Why now does Photonus insist that it's Jesus who's the Son of God and not this eternal Logos? I think the reason has to be found in Luke chapter 1. God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee named Nazareth. He had a message for a young woman promised in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Peace be with you. The Lord is with you and has greatly blessed you. Mary was deeply troubled by the angel's message, and she wondered what his words meant. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God has been gracious to you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will make him a king, as his ancestor David was, and he will be the king of the descendants of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, I am a virgin. How, then, can this be? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and God's power will rest upon you. For this reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Who's called the Son of God? The one that's born. Well, that's the human being. And it seems clear enough that this is a conception that's being talked about, a miraculous conception. She's becoming pregnant because of God's power, not in the normal way. Well, yeah, but a conception, doesn't it bring into existence a human being? That must be how Photonus read it. And we know that there were other reasons why he insisted that Jesus was a man, as opposed to an eternal divine being which exists in a mysterious relationship with a complete human nature, or with a body. What were those reasons? Well, there's 1 Timothy chapter 2. There is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. And that translation softens the point a little bit by using the phrase himself human. Other translations say the mediator between God and man is the man, Christ Jesus, in Greek, Anthropos. Another interesting passage that we know that Photon is focused on is in 1 Corinthians 15. Not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing and that of the earthly is another. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is of heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, 
so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul is talking about the resurrection and immortality, and he's talking about the difference between a resurrected body and the kind of bodies that you and I have now. But Photonus noticed that Paul here says that Adam came first, and that Christ, the Son of God, Jesus, came second, not the other way around. But on the Logos theory, it would be the other way around. His view is, well, so much worse for Logos theory. Another passage he focused on is John 8, where Jesus is in the heat of an argument with some of his Jewish opponents. I know that you are descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me, because there is no place in you for my word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Man, man, man. Jesus is a man. Literally a man, a human being. He had a mother, he was born, he grew up. Did he always exist? Photonus doesn't think so. He thinks the one that always existed was the one true God, and Jesus came into existence late in time. You can see how he would have read this famous passage in John 17. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Surely Photonus would have thought that that pre-existence that was mentioned there by Jesus is just the pre-existence of foreknowledge and predestination. It's pre-existence in God's mind. In other words, it's not a kind of existence. It's just being foreknown. We talked about this common Jewish idiom in two earlier episodes of the Trinity's podcast with Dr. Dustin Smith. These are episodes 61 and 62. Dr. Smith gives numerous examples from Jewish literature and from various places in the New Testament of this idiom at work. Why did they talk about things that were predestined as having always been with God? That was a way of making them inevitable. To put them in the past is to make them unchangeable. To put them in heaven is to imagine them in the hands of God. It's God who guarantees that these things are coming. They're already there, so to speak. It's a great way to communicate things that are predestined to occur. 
When the Trinity's podcast returns, the relevance of some other famous passages in the Gospel according to John for Photonus's Christology. Why didn't Photinus and his followers accept the, at this time, standard arguments that Jesus' teachings and his miraculous deeds show that he must be God or that he must be fully divine? I suggest that part of the reason is, again, the passage in John, this time chapter 14. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If, in my name, you ask me for anything, I will do it. Did you catch that? He said that it's God within him who's doing his works. He doesn't speak on his own. The message is given by God through him, and the miraculous works are done by God through him. And if you think that these works can only be done by God himself or by a divine being... He rules that out in what he goes on to say, which is that his followers will do even greater works than he's done. In other words, they'll have even greater teaching and they'll do even greater miracles. Of course, Peter and Paul and John didn't die for our sins, but Paul did, in a sense, preach a more complete message than Jesus was able to give in his time. And there were further healings, and the message was spread far and wide, and it changed the world. What about the end part? Does it show that he's God because he says he will respond to our requests? No, but it shows that he's exalted to God's right hand and put in charge of the church. So he must have been given tremendous power, authority, and knowledge. So God is in him. God is with him. God is empowering him. That's sufficient for the teaching and it's sufficient for the miracles. He doesn't then have to have a divine nature. There is a divine nature there, of course, in the sense of a divine being. It's God, the one true God, the Father. He doesn't need, in Athanasius' terms, to have a divine nature to be a true son. He's son enough if he's God's unique and fully empowered human Messiah. That's Photonus' view, and I agree. Notice there's a pattern here. He's, in general, sticking with explicit New Testament statements and rejecting the speculations that arguably clash with those. One ancient writer alleges that Photonus said that in John 1, 1, God's internal word is being spoken of, and then in John 1, 2, that's the external word that's being referred to, when he says this word was in the beginning with God. That is something that I don't think you can get out of the text exactly. Maybe this is a holdover speculation he had from Marcellus. One ancient writer objects that Photonus teaches that Christ raised himself from the dead. The normal statement in the New Testament, of course, is that God raised him from the dead. But could Photonus have said that Jesus did it? Sure, he could have, because he could have been quoting John chapter 2. In this scene, Jesus has just driven the money changers out of the temple in Jerusalem 
and he's challenged by some people, how does he have the authority to do something like that? And Jesus chooses to bring up the topic of his own resurrection. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Does John disagree with Luke? Is the fourth gospel contradicting Acts 2, where Peter says that God raised him? I don't think so. It can sound like Jesus here is taking credit for his own resurrection, but... Note that at the end of this passage, it describes Jesus as being raised. Of course, the assumed agent here, the raiser of Jesus, is God. He's just saying that when his body is knocked down, he's going to get it up. Well, right, that's the first thing he did when he was restored to life. So God raised him from the dead, and first thing he did was get up. The second thing he did was probably unwrap himself from the burial cloths that have been put on him. Some people do fasten on this uh, statement and say that God resurrected Jesus, but Jesus resurrected Jesus, so therefore God and Jesus are the same. I assume, actually, that this is the ancient objector's point. I'm guessing that Photinus quoted John 2. Jesus says he's going to raise this temple back up. And the objector said, aha, he's saying that Jesus is the one God himself. He's got Jesus doing what God does. But the passage doesn't require that. It doesn't require that Jesus gets himself up in the same sense in which the God who raised him gets him up. God brings him back to life. Jesus gets up. One last objection from the ancient writer referred to as Ambrosiaster that's not a real name. It basically means pseudo-Ambrose. It was a work ascribed to Ambrose, and then later it was decided that this couldn't possibly be Ambrose, Bishop of Milan. Anyway, this anonymous ancient writer, writing around the same time as Photinus, takes issue especially with his view that Jesus came into existence at his conception. Against this, he offers a passage from John 3 and another from John 16. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but will tell you plainly of the Father. On that day, you will ask in my name. I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again. I am leaving the world, and am going to the Father. His disciples said, Yes, now you are speaking plainly, not in any figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things, and do not need to have anyone question you. And by this, we believe that you came from God. Photinus and his followers understood this coming from heaven to mean basically that God has sent Jesus, that God has really commissioned him and that God is really the source of Jesus' teaching and Jesus' power. 
Other commenters have agreed about this. What comes from heaven is just what comes from God. It's not locomotion. It's not literally coming down from the sky or something like this. Heaven is the abode of God, and given that he was predestined and then sent and empowered by God, he came from heaven in that sense. But that doesn't necessarily imply that he existed in heaven before his earthly life. He came from the Father and has come into the world, and now he's leaving the world and going to the Father. There, of course, he has to mean that he's going to the presence of God, that he isn't going to be in an observable earthly life anymore, at least not until his second coming. The translators of the NIV pull a fast one here and insert the word back, so he says he's going back to the Father, but other translations don't do that. It's not in the Greek. The evidence in the New Testament for the pre-existence of Jesus is actually extremely slim. If you go along with Photinus and Marcellus in thinking that the alleged Christ-creator passages are really talking about his work in the new creation, like in Colossians 1, and if you agree that John 1 is about God's eternal word by which he made everything, not about Jesus' eternal existence and pre-human career, and then you realize that coming from heaven in John is just basically the same thing as being sent by God. We've now whittled down the basis for believing in pre-existence to something really thin, and it was thin to start with. Remember, it's not mentioned in the synoptics, not even once, and it's reading too much into it to infer from Jesus saying, I have come to do this and that, that he existed in another life before he was a man. Another perennial favorite is in John 8, where Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. As I argued back in Trinity's podcast, episode 66, this is plausibly taken to mean that he was the Messiah even back then. But this is predestination in terms of foreknowledge. Of course, his opponents, who are constantly misunderstanding him, object that he's not yet 50, but he's seen Abraham. That's a misunderstanding, of course, and that's why Jesus corrects them. He says that Abraham saw his day, right? Abraham, in his capacity as prophet, foresaw, in some sense, the ministry of the Messiah. So that passage, I don't think, would have been hard for them. Evidently, Photonus was a careful reader, and he was willing to go with the New Testament against later speculations. So were Photonus's views about God and Christ unusual in the 4th century? Well, they were definitely unusual among the ruling class of bishops in the church, that's for sure. How unusual were they at the level of the laity? Nobody knows. It was probably different in different places. Probably there was a large group of Christians like this in Sirmium during the time when Photonus was bishop. At earlier times in church history, particularly in the West, monarchianism was popular, and some of the monarchians seem to me to have held views a lot like these. What about the earliest Christians? Well, they very easily could have held views like these. The thing that everybody forgets now is that for many decades, Logos theory was controversial. It was elitists. It was very Hellenized thinkers like Justin like Tertullian, like Origen, who were promoting the Logos theory. And they tell us that ordinary Christians pushed back and said, hey, we believe in one creator. Where'd you get this other one from? We believe in one God. You're talking now about two gods. Now, how could they say that? Didn't they have the gospel according to John? Yeah, we think they did. And we also think they had Paul's letters. So they just understood Colossians 1 and John 1 to not mean what the Logos theorists said. Now a lot of people consider those readings to be super obvious. I think we need a wider context of thought to consider. And even though he's practically disappeared from history, and all of his works have disappeared, Photonus does give us that other perspective. Photonus has theological views like mine, but I didn't come to them because of Photonus. I came to them over the course of about a decade, really digging hard into the New Testament and trying to interpret it in first century ways, trying not to anachronistically read later concerns back into it. And with the help of some others, current day and early modern, 
I came to Photinian type views. I don't call myself a Photinian. I'm not a disciple of his, just like I don't call myself a Socinian. But I wouldn't be ashamed to have either name applied to me as a first rough approach to what my views are. Of course, I don't believe anything in theology because Socin has said it or because Photon has said it. I'm trying to follow Jesus, and I'm taking his apostles and the other writers of the New Testament seriously. Other speculations I have to take on more cautiously because of their source. But as far as this controversy is concerned, views like the Photinians are just non-starters. They're just off the map, obviously wrong. They don't play any significant role in the rest of the controversy. Marcellus is sidelined and silenced and seemingly brought around to Nicene views. Photinus is just damned enthusiastically. They heard Photinus's arguments. You don't get to. Still, we've tried to reconstruct them, and there's a comprehensible skeleton of an approach to the New Testament there. And it's a type of approach that later on, when you don't have the bishops controlling everything, keeps coming back again and again. In my view, with good reason. Music has been the track Procreation by Little Glass Men. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to or download the entire track. Hey, would you do me a favor? If you haven't already, would you leave an honest rating and review of the Trinity's podcast in the iTunes store for your country? Doing this will help other people to find out about the podcast. An easy way to do this is to click the red Leave a Review button, which is just under the podcast player on any podcast blog post episode at trinities.org. Again, just look for the red Leave a Review button. If you have iTunes installed, that will take you there. And if you enjoyed this week's episode, don't forget to share on social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Next week, a council-produced creed, which some have described as a blasphemy. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.